Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And I want you to respond to this question honestly. How many of you like arguing? How many of you guys like arguing? Some of our kids probably need to have that hand up. Parents are next to them. How many of you like arguing? Now, now, let me ask the question a little bit differently. How many of you like debating? Right? Arguing and debating. Okay, they're, they're related. They're probably cousins, but there is a difference. Now, if any of you all uh, have served or did time on a, uh, on a debate team, you actually have something in common with your pastors. Both Pastor Kale and myself uh, were on Concordia Nebraska's speech and debate team in college. Now, we weren't on the team at the same time because I'm a little bit older than Pastor Kale. No, you guys didn't buy that for a second. It's the other way around. But so formalized debate, it, it, different than arguing, because there, there's rules and there's standards. If you're arguing, it's pretty much just whoever's loudest, whoever's the most upset, uh, that, that's, that's who wins. Eventually, someone just gets up. Uh, debate, th- there's actual rules and standards. And depending on wh- which type of, of formalized debate you're doing, one of the parts of the debate is actually debating about what the standard should be. So each side can go up, you have the same thing you're arguing either for or against, but you can say, well, we should look at this uh, and judge it. Uh, you know, the decision should be based on uh, something like utilitarianism, that the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And the other team can come up and say, no, it should actually be cost-benefit analysis. Do the, do the costs outweigh uh, the benefits? Uh, it, that's called a criterion. Uh, and, and basically what it is, is it's a, a standard by which we say, this is how we should judge uh, who wins the argument. Uh, this is how, how we should judge uh, what is good and bad, what is right and wrong. It's a criterion. It's one of the things that I learned uh, when I did debate. And, and, and now looking at, at our world, uh, looking at how we live life on earth, I think actually this is a, something we should explore. What is our criterion? What is our standard by which we determine what is right and what is wrong? What is good and what is bad? What should I do and what shouldn't I do? What is worth my time and what isn't? What is the criterion that we use that we judge how we live our lives uh, and how we interact with the world around us? Because there's a whole bunch of options of what we can pick. We, we could pick Things that come straight from debate. Utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Uh, the way that we, we use that in our world oftentimes is actually uh, majority rules. It's d- democracy. is well, whatever the majority thinks is right, which very quickly turns into whatever is popular, do that. Whatever is popular, do that. And if I'm, I'm in the right crowd, if I'm doing the right things, if, if on the outward appearance I look like I'm with uh, the way that, that the world is going, then uh, life is easier, life is better, I'm doing just fine. The problem is popularity and, and culture change so often. I mean, in, in the last even decade, we looked at, at how much has changed in terms of what's acceptable, what's right much less uh, over the course of someone's lifetime. It can be exhausting trying to chase whatever the most recent thing that is right is. And you never know from one day to the next, from one moment to the next, uh, am I on the right track or I'm not? Because this could change in a moment. See, seeking after popularity, whatever the majority thinks is right, doesn't actually mean that they're right. So that, that's not a sufficient criteria for us uh, to be able to judge in our world. Well, the, the other option, and actually I think the primary option uh, in our world, including what, what most of us kind of gravitate towards, uh, even within the church, is do whatever makes you happy. Whatever makes you happy, that, that's the criteria. If, if it sparks joy, keep it. If not, throw it out. Right? And whatever makes you happy, whatever, whatever is pleasing, whatever feels right to you, do it. That's fine. That, that's the type of life uh, to pursue. 
that's the driving force uh, for the majority of us. And, and, and uh, in our own lives, uh, that's where I think the current tends to gravitate us, us towards. Well, this makes me feel happy, and so I'm going to do it. Uh, and, and, and if it doesn't, uh, th- then I'm not going to. And the, the problem lies in the fact that, that our happiness, uh, we're letting it, it drive the ship rather than, than finding things that maybe our emotions are going to uh, come along to. Is we can't actually control our emotions. We, we can seek after happiness and not find it. The, the other problem is that we become so focused on our own happiness that we make everyone else around us miserable. Because if, if the criteria of life is whatever makes me happy, then it doesn't matter the people around me, what, what they think, what their needs are. And pers- the pursuit of happiness, oftentimes it ends up, it, it's a self-centered pursuit and it, it is a short-sighted pursuit that I'm looking for whatever was going to make me happy in the moment, and I'm, and I'm losing sight of, of what is perhaps better in the long run. See, happiness is not a sufficient criterion for, for a life that is looking beyond the next moment. So the other thing that the world will, will offer us uh, is, is simply uh, do, do whatever it is that seems to be the most, most profitable. And so our life becomes so focused on, on success in a worldly sense. And it, how many people do we know that they pursued that for most of their life and they're getting towards the end and they look back and they don't think, man, I wish I had one more dollar. No, they look back over your life and they said, that pursuit of success, of achievement, of climbing the ladder was not worth the sacrifices that were made to get there. See, ultimately, the criterion of the world, the way that we judge what should I do, what's right and what's wrong, ends up being temporary, ends up being short-sighted. Is what we default to, well, what, do whatever is easiest. Right? That, that, that's the, the default uh, setting for people that are busy. And by the way, that's the one thing that Americans can agree on, is that we're busy. And so let, let, let's just do whatever is easiest. Or wh- whatever comes naturally, whatever is easiest, that, that's just, just fine. And we realize that whatever is easiest is not always what is best. In fact, oftentimes, the things that are worthwhile, the things that actually impact us, they take effort, they take time, we don't see the results right away. See, and if we as a church buy the criterion that are offered in the world, we end up living lives that are simply focused on what is easy and what is best, what is convenient. And hardly anything about discipleship, about following Jesus is easy or convenient. It's certainly not popular. It's certainly not something that is going to lead to success in the ways and the eyes of the world. It's so tempting to sit and to, to look at uh, the lands of the world and think, well, this, it would be so much better, it would be so much easier if I followed that. See, and then this isn't new to us. I mean, Peter is writing to a church that is experiencing tremendous persecution. And it's, it'd be so easy for them to look and say, rather than, than following Jesus, why don't I just do what's easiest? It's easiest for me to just go with the way of the culture. It's better uh, for, for my family if we're not being persecuted. Well, let, let's, let's just give this whole thing up. It's not worth the effort. But let me pursue success, happiness, whatever it else that we see in the world. And yet what Peter's exhorting the church to do is don't give up on what actually matters, on what actually lasts. Because if we go the way of the world and focus on, on whatever is temporary, we're losing sight on the opportunity to give witness to something that lasts, something that changes. See, what Peter offers in his letter to a church that is struggling, 
church that is being persecuted, what he offers to you and to me in the midst of a world where it looks like it'd be a lot better, be a lot easier to just give all this up. He offers up us a different criterion, a different lens through which we view our lives and our worlds. Here's what he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, our epistle reading for today. It says, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. You were ransomed, you were freed from the feudal ways of the world, from simply looking at whatever is easiest, whatever is most profitable, whatever is successful, whatever is popular. You've been freed from something that doesn't last, from something that is temporary. You've been freed, not by gold or silver, but by the holy, precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. It says you've been set free from only thinking about yourself, only thinking about whatever comes next. You've been brought into a new story, a new way of living. It says, what does this Easter living look like? What is the criterion by which we judge our lives? Here's what he says. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flowers of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. See, Paul is inviting the church, he's inviting you and me to trade the criteria, the lens of whatever's easiest, whatever uh, makes us uh, feel the best in the moment, whatever is popular, whatever is successful. Just trade that in and ask, what is faithful? What does the Word of God say? Because the Word doesn't change. Our criterion is the living and abiding Word of God. See, God's Word isn't just a book that we have that collects dust on our shelf. It's not just something that we hear and say, oh, that sounds nice, and then we walk away. But the Word of God, the promises of God are meant to live, to abide in us, to be the criterion through which we judge our world. See, it doesn't matter if it's easiest what's faithful. It doesn't matter if it's popular, what does God say? It doesn't matter if it leads to success in this life because I'm investing in something that is eternal. You know, I recognize that, that I, I lost some of you guys with the, the, the debate imagery because that's not uh, stuff that you're familiar with. So l- let me take another stab at, at visualizing this for us. Uh, you all know what this is? <laughs> yeah, these are sunglasses. You don't have to be on a debate team to know what this is. Yeah, it's sunglasses. This pair in particular is, uh, was from Concordia, Chicago, uh, which uh, we have many of our members that are, that are uh, alumni uh, of that institution. So... Uh, I'm from Concordia, Nebraska, but here we go. Shout out to all of our Concordias. So uh, sunglasses, w- what they do, whether this is a pretty simple fair, pair, all the way up to the really fancy ones that you buy for hundreds of dollars and then break or lose within 15 minutes. <laughs> These things cost me nothing. They're going to last forever. That's the rule of sunglasses. And so how sunglasses work is, is that they filter out what comes in and what you see looking out. See, a, a sunglasses, they filter out the, that which, which is damaging the ultraviolet light. And they also change the way that you see uh, from behind them. God's word is meant to be like sunglasses where it, it filters out that which is harming and damaging in the world. Right, that we would stand on the promises of God, that we are, we are bought, we are ransomed with the blood of Christ. That instead of looking in the mirror in the morning and seeing our failures, our shortcomings, not liking what we see, that that would be filtered out through the word of God. We would know that we are forgiven. We have been bought, ransomed by the blood of Christ. We're not defined by our sins, we're defined by his grace. You are forgiven that you were loved by God, that you belong to him. That we would filter out the criterion, the ways of the world that tend to focus on our failures, focus on our shortcomings, and instead we would see ourselves 
the light of Christ, as those who belong to the God who has saved us. That not only would God's word be living and active and changing how we see ourselves, but they would be living and active through how we see the world around us. We would see the people around us not as competition, uh, not, not as a burden on our success, on our happiness, but we would see them through the lens of God, God's word. As people for whom Christ died, as people who are valuable, as people who are forgiven, whether they know it or not, that God's word would be living and active in us, that we would begin to see the people around us like he sees them, that when we go to work, we, we don't simply see people uh, that, that perhaps we're in competition with for a promotion, perhaps people that, that bother us and keep us from doing the work that we're supposed to be doing, but that we would see them as someone for whom Christ died. We'd see that relationship as an opportunity to serve, to love, to share the hope of Christ with them. For those of you that are students, that you would see your classroom not just a place to learn, not simply as, as a place where I've got to follow the rules, I've got to do this so that I can get outside and enjoy recess, which is the favorite subject of 90% of students. No, but that we would see our teachers as a blessing, as a gift from God, the opportunity to gather, to encourage one another. Here at Zion Lutheran School, to hear the word of God, to be changed by it, we would see that as an opportunity that is worth investing in. And as a congregation, as parents, as families, it's an investment. And the world will look at that and say, that's not success. That, that's, that's actually taking away from your happiness, from your savings, from whatever. But we would look at this opportunity through the word of God and say, no, this is what truly matters, investing in the word of God, of sharing and growing that faith from, from kids early on all the way through. That investment is in something that is eternal and that's so much greater uh, than, than, than simply a bank account here on this earth, which is not going to last. You see, as we see our lives, as we see this world, we begin to see in light of eternity through the living word of God, we see all these opportunities around us, we begin to look at our neighbors differently. We begin to look at, at our, our spouse, our kids, our friends differently because they're someone for whom Christ died. They're someone that, that God has put me in a relationship with to encourage, to share, to forgive, to love. And as God's word is living and active in our lives, when that becomes the criterion versus simply what's easiest, simply what's popular, what leads to temporary success. When, when we look at the world around us through the lens of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, death and resurrection for you, I think we end up finding we're a lot less worried. Because that which is temporary, we tend to be so focused on and, and get all worked up over but when I look through the gospel and see all of this is being held in the hands of my God, I don't need to worry. I don't need to be focused on, on, on just success in this life because I know that my God is taking care of me, not only now, but for eternity. We live a life that, that is more purposeful because we know that uh, life is not just, just about building a name or an empire for myself, but life is about sharing the almighty word of a God who loves and forgives us, not just now, but for an eternity. See, the story that we've been invited to, Easter living, filtering our lives through the lens of the gospel, puts our feet on a foundation that doesn't change, that stays the same. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of your God stands forever. In his name, amen. amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until he calls you home. Amen.